Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Take a bearing from this verse. One verse. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. For unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called. Everybody say together. Wonderful. Let's say let's do that again. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, and his name shall be called. Isaiah goes on to say, Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and his name shall be called Wonderful. I have the singular privilege to introduce you today to the wonderful Jesus. Somebody say the wonderful Jesus the wonderful Jesus. Let us say a word of prayer. Thank you for your presence in this place as I speak. I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. As I speak, I ask that our hearts receive the seed of the word of God and it grows. It grows significantly in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much. We'll be back here. Um, 1963, um, Grammy and Emmy Award winner Andy Williams released his first Christmas album, the Andy Williams Christmas album. Um, I don't think there was a lot of creativity happening then with album naming, but he called it that. The Andy Williams Christmas album. And even though White Christmas, the first song on that album, was chosen as the promotional single for the album to increase and to drum up sales and marketing, one other song on that album went on to be, uh, to capture the hearts and the minds of millions across the world. And that song is Most Wonderful Time of the Year. How many of you know that song? It's the most wonderful time of the year. You can sing with me. The kids are jingle belling and everyone's telling you be of good cheer. It's the most wonderful time of the year. No, don't ooh don't that. That was not an ooable singer. According to the song, um, the most wonderful time of the year is characterized by kids' jingle bell and is characterized by happy greetings and meetings as friends come together, come calling. It's characterized by marshmallows toasting, by caroling in the snow. It's characterized by hearts glowing as friends and loved ones meet each other. Um, while those are beautiful sentiments, while those are beautiful sentiments for what is the most wonderful time of the year, I believe that it's the most wonderful time of the year year for a very different reason. I believe that Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year because that's the time we celebrate when heaven invaded earth. We celebrate when the word of God became flesh. We celebrate when God took the form of man. We celebrate that Jesus was born. Thousands of years before, before Andy Williams captured is the most wonderful time of the year. Isaiah captured a most wonderful child that was going to be born. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 that we read. The Bible says that unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. Isaiah was talking as if it was in the present but he was looking prophetically in the future. Standing in the middle of what was going to be the space where this boy was born. He says unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government, the authority will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful. That Hebrew word there, Pele, means unusual. It means marvelous thing. It means miracle. It means extraordinary. It means hard to understand. It's from the Greek word, the Hebrew word, pala, that means to be, surpass, to be surpassing, to be wonderful, to be separate, to distinguish. It means to separate by distinguishing action. And the Hebrew word their name is reputation, is fame. I'm going somewhere with this. It's honor, it's authority, it's character, it's a mark of individuality. So Isaiah was saying in other words, if we're to make it, bring it into our, our context, it will be his reputation will be unusual. His fame will be extraordinary. His mark of individuality will be miraculous. The glory shall not be separate. His glory shall be separated from everyone else's by distinguishing action. His name will be wonderful. It's difficult to grasp 
the meaning of the season if we don't understand and we don't have a revelation of who makes the season wonderful, the wonderful one who makes the season wonderful. So my duty today is to introduce you to Jesus. Isaiah calls him the counselor. Isaiah calls him the mighty one, the prince of peace. He calls him the everlasting father. And Isaiah says of his kingdom, there will be no end. But of all the names that Isaiah calls him, I choose to dwell on wonderful because that takes my breath away. Because Isaiah says Jesus is wonderful. So I'm going to introduce you to Jesus, the wonderful. And that introduction begins with number one. He has a wonderful name. If you were, if you'd grow up in any kind of old school church there is this song that we used to sing bless that wonderful name of Jesus wonderful you guys are not singing young people Jesus oh people sing Jesus it's very simple there we go no other name I know there's healing in the name there's healing in the name Healing in the Jesus. Healing in the <laughs> Jesus. There's power in the name next. No other name. Let's sing power in the name. Everybody sing it. Sing a very simple song. Power. There's power in the name. Of... You're not singing. Jesus. Power. Jesus. There is power. Power in the name of Jesus. No other name I know. You can now. Ooh, that was an Uebu. Uebu sing. <laughs> but that song says his wonderful name is Jesus. His powerful name is Jesus. His saving name is Jesus. One verse says his healing name is Jesus. The wonderful name is Jesus. The name of Jesus is marvelous. The name of Jesus is surpassing. The name of Jesus is extraordinary. The name of Jesus is wonderful. This name was not randomly chosen by Mary and Joseph. It was given to him by God. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 verse 21, and when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angels before he was conceived in the womb. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, it says, and she will bring forth a son and you shall name him Jesus. So his name was not randomly chosen. His name is a revelation of the fulfillment of the promise of God. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22 goes on to say, So all this could be done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin with, who shall be with child and bear a son and his name shall be Emmanuel. They shall call his name Emmanuel which translates or is translated to mean God with us. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. And um, echoes this same sentiment. It says, His name shall be called Emmanuel. It was prophetic to say, God is now with us. Pastor Victor, give me some more Bible. John chapter 1, verse 1 says this In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Permit me to just break that down a little bit for those of you sometimes who are confused about the presence of a Trinity. The Bible says, In the beginning was the world. It establishes a person. This person is a singular person, has a personality of his own, and it's says the word was with God. That means this one person was with another person that is referred to in this verse as God. So word, the person is referred to as being with this other person called God. So now we see personality, we see a partnership and all of a sudden he says and this word, these two people are actually one. The word was God. Then he goes on to say in verse 12 or verse 14 that that word, that person became flesh. If you're looking for God or Jesus in Genesis, he wasn't Jesus then, he was the Word. The Bible says, and God said. The words that he used to create the world was actually what we know now as Jesus. Since the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us and we have seen his glory. So the birth of Jesus, the word becoming flesh was the fulfillment of prophecy that God was going to be with us. His name also give, gives us the right to become children of God. John says in verse 12 of chapter 1, but as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe where in his name. 
He goes on to say that, 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 that this is not, it doesn't just give me the right to become a child of God. It gives me access. It gives me, he helps me approach God in prayer. John chapter 16 verse 23 says, And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name and you will receive. I ask nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy joy may be full. In that day, you will ask how in my name. Everybody say in the name of Jesus. Everybody say in the name of Jesus. John chapter 14 verse 13 says, and whatsoever you ask in my name, that I will do. So it gives me, it gives me access to approach God in prayer. Also gives me access to the presence of God. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20 says, when two or three are gathered, how, I, I gathered how together in his name, there he is in the midst of him. So if I want to provoke the presence of God, all I need to do is call upon a brother or a sister and we gather in his name and all of a sudden there he is. That's why you want to be in a small group because when you join a small group, just the mere fact that one person came for the small group, that means the presence of God is there. Looking for the hack for the presence of God. The Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. If I begin to give thanks, God begins to show up. If I gather with one of my brother or my sister, God begins to show up. That's the hack for the presence of God. It's really not that difficult. Yeah. Right. Right. The Bible says, if I gather and we gather together in his name, he is there. That's why I tell you to tell your neighbor, God is here. I hope you take advantage of it. The Bible says his name gives me power over the devil. Gives me power over the devil. Mark chapter 16 verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow those who believe. How? In my name they will cast out demons. Anybody that tells you that demons do not exist, tell them that there will be no need to cast them out if they don't exist. Tell them that there will be no need for the name of Jesus that helps me cast them out if they don't exist. And how do you cast them out? In the name of Jesus. Um, the Bible says that the 70, um, or the 70 disciples of Jesus, the 12, and then they were the 70, went out to preach and they came back. Luke chapter 10, verse 17. And the Bible says they came back and they returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons were subject to us. How? In your name. So it doesn't just help me cast out demons. The name of Jesus also helps us heal the sick. Acts chapter 3 verse 6 says, And then Peter said to a man that was crippled on their way to the temple, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the Bible says the man, got, he got up and he was walking and leaping, jumping and leaping and praising God. And they went into the temple and people recognized that this man walking now, and jumping and leaping was the same man who was crippled a few minutes ago. What happened? Acts chapter 4 verse 7. Peter goes on to say, and the Bible says, and when they set him in their midst, they asked him, by what power, not this, and by what name have you done this? Most of us dwell so much on the power that we forget the name. They ask that two ways this could have happened, by the power or by a name. Which of it is it? Is it a power or by name? I said no, by both. We just evoke the power by calling the name. Verse 8 says, And Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you, not just walking, but whole. I don't have time to explore that. Not just walking, but whole. So the name of Jesus is wonderful. It's a name given to him by his father, God. It's a name that is the revelation of the fulfillment of the promise. It's a name that gives us the right to become children of God. It's a name that helps us approach God in prayer and gives us access to his presence. It's a name that helps us drive by the power of his name and the Holy Spirit to drive away demons and devils. And it's a name that heals the sick. Everybody say the name of Jesus is wonderful. Everybody say the name of Jesus is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Number two, why am I celebrating this most wonderful season is because he, Jesus, is the most wonderful man that ever existed 
Isaiah says, his name shall be called wonderful. And we establish that that word is the Hebrew word pele that means unusual. It means marvelous thing. It means miracle. It means extraordinary. It's hard to explain. That Hebrew word pele actually appears about 13 times in the Old Testament. And um, almost every time is used to describe an act a doing, an activity. Uh, Exodus chapter 15 verse 11 says, who is like you, O Lord, amongst the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Psalms chapter 77 verse 14 says, you are the God who does wonders. It's also used to describe the word of God. Psalms chapter 119 verse 129 in the contemporary English version says, Your teachings, your words are wonderful and I respect them. But I looked through the Bibles and I could not see anybody described as wonderful except Jesus. So while it describes the doings and it describes the word of God, appropriately describes the word of God, but then Isaiah he describes this man. Isaiah looks beyond the word, for, the word form of Jesus and looks into the future and describes uh, in the future what he describes the word of God as. The word of God is wonderful, but the person who is actually the word of God made flesh is also wonderful. So he describes this man as wonderful. Why is Jesus wonderful? His birth was prophesied from the beginning of time. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says, And when um, the serpent had deceived Adam and Eve, the Bible says, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. We know um, biologically that women do not have seed. So he was not just talking about biological seed. We also know that it was not going to be a man that provided the seed for Jesus. So he was saying, the only human that is going to be participating in this her seed is going to be in enmity against you he was talking about his son Jesus say so he, he will bruise your head and you will bruise his feet so his birth is prophesied his assignment was clearly stated before his birth Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 says and she will bring forth a son and you shall name him Jesus and here is his objective here is his assignment for he will save his people from their sins. When the angels appeared and they were sharing the good news to the shepherds uh, that eventually visited Jesus, Luke chapter 2 verse 11 says, there is to be born this day in the city of David who a savior who is Christ the Lord. And when God, Jesus was finally born and he encounters John the Baptist, John chapter 1 verse 29, the next day John saw him coming towards him and John said by the unction of the Holy Spirit, Behold, the Lamb of God, assignment, who takes away the sins of the world. So his assignment was already decided before he was born. And he was to be born of a virgin. Matthew 1, 21, I love that verse. It says, and the virgin shall be with child. And then in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, and then the angel, Mary said to the angel, I know what you've said. You said, I'm going to get pregnant. I'm going to have a child, but I don't know any man. I've not uh, participated in what's supposed to make this happen naturally. And the angel said to her, verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. In case you want to understand how God works, he works through the Holy Spirit. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Holy Spirit was hovering and waiting for the word of God to be said. And God said, let there be light. And when he said it, the same Holy Spirit that was hovering over began to execute what the word was. He says, how is this going to be? How am I going to get pregnant if I know no man? Don't worry about it. There's a, a divine how, how it operates. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. He was saying his God, his father is going to be God, don't worry. Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 says this. And as Joseph considered whether he was going to send away Mary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So God is claiming his child. Born of virgin birth. 
And as this child is born, there is almost increased activity. You, will not, you don't understand the significance of all the angelic activity if you don't understand that between the Old Testament and the New Testament was 400 years when there was silence. God did not say, there's no recorded word of God. God did not say anything. And all of a sudden, his son is about to be born and God cannot stop talking. Angels cannot stop descending and ascending and appearing. An angel appears to Mary. An angel appears to Joseph two times. Angels appear to the shepherds and actually do a worship experience for them. They were singing glory like every, every angel, angel, angel everywhere. If I was alive, who knows? Maybe an angel would have come to me. Who knows? But heaven cannot sit still because the king of kings is about to be born. Because the Lord of Lords is about to be born. Eh? The heavens cannot sit still. There, there is angelic activity. God is speaking. The universe is professing that somebody special is about to be born. And all of a sudden, this special, this extraordinary, this unusual, this miraculous, this hard to understand baby is born. And guess where he's born? In the meekest, most unassuming place. He's born with animals and has to be placed in a feeding trough of animals. This great king is born in the most humble place. This extraordinary king is, is, is born in the, in the lowest of places. But even though he's born in the lowest of places, he attracts the wisest of men who see the exuberance, the cosmic exuberance around them as represented by the star and they walk towards the star and they're looking for the king whose star has just appeared. There was no star last night, but all of a sudden, the heavens are shifting and there's a celebration as marked by the star. Even the skies are responding. Even the planetary systems are responding. Do you know how far a star is to respond to the birth of Jesus on earth? And you tell me that it's not the God of the universe? That's the scripture that proves that when God moves stars millions of light years away, respond to his activity. He just chose to make earth the focus of his activity. The Bible says that he's born that he attracts wise men. So while an innkeeper saw an inconvenience that he shushed away to where his horses and donkeys were, the wise men saw a king. While Herod saw somebody who threatened his leadership and his royalty, the wise men brought gifts to honor this royalty. And then he grows up and verse 12, he sits down. He's found sitting down with teachers of the law. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2 verse 45, so when they did not find him, they went to Jerusalem for a, a routine festival. And when they came back, they found out Jesus was not in their company. They go back to Jerusalem. And then the Bible says after three days, they found him. Luke chapter 2 verse 46, sitting in the midst of teachers, both listening and asking questions. And all of who heard him were astonished at his understanding and at his answers. So at age 12, he's already becoming unusual. Who is this child at age 12? Who do, who do you think you are? Where did you go to school? And he has expository um, knowledge that they don't understand. And finally, he goes away. And for 18 years, we don't know what is happening. He reappears at age 30. Matthew chapter 3, verse 16. And when he comes to John to baptize him, John baptizes him to fulfill prophecy, to mark the end of the Old Testament. Because John was the last prophet. Even though he's contained in the New Testament, he was the last prophet of the Old Testament. That's why Jesus said, the lowest in my kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. And John the Baptist baptizes him and the Bible says, as he came out, behold, came out immediately from the water, behold, the heavens were open to him on next year. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. So his baptism opens up the heavens. This has never happened to a man. Finally, he's released into ministry. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 28, so it was that when Jesus had ended his sayings, that the people were astonished again. So at age 12, they are astonished. Age 30, they are astonished. So the astonishment was not a one-off. Astonishment was who he was because he is wonderful, because he is unusual, because he is extraordinary. Even from his birth, he's extraordinary. So we see a consistency of character at age 12 and age 30. When he speaks, people are astonished. Whether you're a teacher or a listener, when he speaks, people are astonished. And they, and they said he taught like one having authority, not like the scribes. Shade. I like the Bible. It's very shady. That's where I draw my inspiration from. 
The Bible says he taught with power, and the Bible says his ministry was powered and characterized by compassion. Matthew, Mark chapter 6, verse 34 said, And Jesus, when he came out, saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion for them. His ministry was characterized by love, just deeply, not by trying to prove what he knew or what he could do, but by compassion. He had compassion on them. And not only did he have compassion of them, not only was his ministry powered by compassion, he associated with people that other people ostracized. Mark chapter 2 verse 15 says, Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. Note this, for there were many. Many, not like one off, not like the almost good sinner, like the sinner, like a sinner, but not like really, really a sinner. You know what I mean? No, so there were many. And when you read your Bible, the tax collectors were the most hated people. Why? They represented the Romans to them. They took their levies. How many of you like paying taxes? You enjoy it, it makes you happy. You jump for joy anytime you pay. Exactly. How you feel, just imagine that's happening during an oppressive government. And that government is taking your money. That's, they did not like him, but Jesus was with them. So not only was he driven by compassion, he was driven to stay with people that other people rejected. So Jesus' birth was extraordinary. His childhood was extraordinary. His ministry was extraordinary. When he taught, he taught as an extraordinary, unusual, hard to understand person. How can the savior of the world, someone who claims to be God himself, be dining and whining with people who are least like God? He was extraordinary. He was unusual. So he has a wonderful name. He himself, as described by Isaiah, is wonderful. Everybody say Jesus is wonderful. No, close your eyes and just think about everything I've said. Unusual, marvelous, hard to understand, extraordinary, surpassing. Surpassing and separates by distinguishing action. This man is wonderful. Everybody just say Jesus. Everybody say Jesus is wonderful. Everybody say Jesus. Shout it from your belly. Jesus, Jesus is wonderful. wonderful. He has a wonderful name. He is a wonderful man. The most wonderful man to ever exist. And number three, and I round up with this. He does wonderful things. Um, when I say that, most of us take that for granted. So I took on the laborious process, if I might add, of, of putting together the resume of God. Let me tell you what he has done. Almost like God is, is, is applying for some space in your heart. God is applying to have a relationship with you. So I decided, and by the power of the Holy Spirit and under his direction, to read out the resume of Christ. Let's not do the slow music right now. Just give me one minute. I will tell you when. So let's just brag on Jesus for a bit. Let me, let me show you what Jesus has done. I didn't want to get all eloquent and tell you and break down scripture about what I said. Let me just tell you what he has done as recorded by other men. The Bible says Jesus turned water to wine. John chapter 2 verse 1. Jesus healed the noble man's son. John chapter 4 verse 46. He gave Simon Peter a great haul of fishes. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. The same Jesus cast out an evil spirit. Mark chapter 1 verse 23. He cured and healed Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. Mark chapter 1 verse 30. He healed a leper, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. The same Jesus healed the centurion's servant, Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. He raised the widow's son from the dead, Luke chapter 7, verse 11. He calmed the storm, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. He healed two demon-possessed men, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. He healed the paralytic, Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. He raised the synagogue leader's daughter from the dead, Matthew chapter 9, verse 18. And in case you think he was done, Jesus healed the woman with the issue of blood, Luke chapter 8. Jesus opened the eyes of two blind men, Matthew chapter 9. Jesus loosened the tongue of a man who could not speak, the same Matthew chapter 9, verse 32. Jesus healed a crippled man at the pool called Bethesda, John chapter 5. Jesus restored a withered hand, Matthew chapter 12. Jesus healed another demon-possessed man, Matthew chapter 12. Jesus fed at least 5,000 people. Men were counted. Women and kids were not counted. Matthew chapter 14. Jesus 
Jesus healed the demon possessed daughter of a Canaanite woman. Jesus healed a deaf and mute man. Mark chapter 9 and he was not done. Jesus fed at least 4,000 people separate from the 5,000 people. Jesus opened the eyes of another blind man. Jesus healed a boy who was oppressed by a demon. Jesus opened the eyes of a man who was born blind. Jesus healed a woman who was bent over for 18 years. Jesus healed a man of abnormal swelling. Jesus healed 10 lepers. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus opened the eyes of another set of two blind men. Jesus caused the fig tree to wither. Jesus restored the ears of the high priest servants. Jesus gave Peter another haul of fish. And guess what? When he died, Jesus rose from the dead. Nobody has ever done that. That's the resume of Jesus. While you keep remaining standing, let me give you the crowning. Well, some prophets of some other religions walk away into the sunset. When Jesus was done, he chose not to go as a man. He decided to go as God. I know I came into this joint as a man. I came into this joint as a baby and I had to be pushed out through a woman. But when I'm leaving, I'm not leaving as a man. I'm leaving as God. I'm leaving as God. The Bible says when he was done, he dropped the mic and then just ascended. Where do you think all the sci-fi movies get their inspiration from? When it's time to go back to the mothership, what do you do? You just ascend. Because I'm not a man. I'm not just your ordinary man. I'm wonderful. You just remain standing, I'm done. So the question that begs now, is Pastor Vic, what does that mean for me? You guys don't have this, but Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says this. Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me say that again. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 8. Jesus the same yesterday today and forever that means that if Jesus healed them and he's not changed he's still the same 2,000 years ago as he is now that means if Jesus healed them Jesus can heal me. That means if Jesus can raise them from the dead, that means he can revive every dead thing in my life. If Jesus calmed the storm, that means he can calm every storm in my life. If Jesus provided fish sandwich for everyone, for thousands of people, he can definitely provide for my family. If Jesus could straighten out a woman who was bent over for 18 years, he can straighten out the best of a parts of your life. He's a wonder in my soul. That means I have a name that unlocks the miraculous. I have a name that sends devils and demons running. I have a name that destroys anything that tries to hold and suppress me. A man who died for my sins. A man who loves me when the world shuns me and ostracizes me. That's the man we're talking about, Jesus. You might be feeling left out and nobody cares about you. There is a man, a wonderful man who cares about you. When no one will talk to you, he wants to have a relationship with you. He's a wonder. You know, so he died and he gave us access. I know it's not Easter, but the reason he was born was so he can die. The reason he was born as a man was so he can die as a man. Christmas means that Jesus was not just wonderful then. Jesus is wonderful now because the future that Isaiah was standing in when he was talking in the past tense is the future that we're standing in now when Jesus appeared in the past. Do you, do you understand? 
Isaiah came from his presence to a future that became the future of Jesus so that in our present we can enjoy what is the past and what will be the future of Jesus. He's wonderful. He's wonderful then. He's wonderful now. So Andy Williams, I know it's the most wonderful time of the year, but it's not most wonderful because of marshmallows and because of friends coming together and kids jingle belling. It's wonderful because the most wonderful man, Jesus, was born as man. And today we choose to celebrate it. If you want to celebrate it, why don't you just celebrate it? I'm not going to cajole you. Why don't you celebrate it like you understand? That he's wonderful. That he's unusual. That he's extraordinary. You're a wonder in my soul. You're a wonder. Next time you hear the song, it's the most wonderful time of the year. You know what Andy was trying to say but did not really get. He's saying that a man, a wonderful man, was born.